Elon Musk. Have you heard that name recently? Been in the news a little bit? He is the CEO and founder of, uh, of the company Tesla. He is in the process of buying Twitter right now. He also is in charge of SpaceX. He's wanting to colonize Mars. Wowzers. Ambitious, right? Forbes said that he has got a net value of over $200 billion. Ooh. Jeff Bezos from Amazon, right? They say he's, what, over $100 billion as well. We all know if you receive a package or two at your house from Amazon. These guys are uber successful, right? I mean, they've got more money than, yeah, all of us combined and we'll ever see, right? I mean, it's just amazing of what they have accomplished in this world. But what does it mean? Today we're going to look in Ecclesiastes as we continue in our worship series of Who Cares and looking at things that we worship. And King Solomon is going to look at how we worship God or do we worship money? Let's pray as we open God's Word. Father, thanks for everyone who's gathered here today. Father, you are good, and we are thankful for all the good blessings and things that you provide to us. And even in the difficulties of our lives, Father, we acknowledge that we depend on you. And so as we open your word this day, Father, teach us, encourage us, remind us, maybe recalibrate what we may be seeking at this time in our lives, that what we would do, Father, throughout all aspects of our lives, we would honor you and revere you. So Holy Spirit, teach us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you, if you'd please open up the Bibles that are before you. And as always, <clears throat> I know I'm a little bit rote on that, and that's, that's good. We need to open God's Word because this is our guide for our lives, right? This is why we do that each week. I encourage you, get the Bibles out that are before you. If you have your own Bible, open that up. And we're going to look at Ecclesiastes 5 today, reading the whole chapter. So please leave the Bible out throughout the message. I'm going to be referring back to it. You can see the page numbers there. We have two different Bibles uh, out in the chairs, and some there's a little bit variance in some translations, but you'll get the gist of, of uh, where we're going today. But in Ecclesiastes 5, we'll start with verse 1. Now, if you haven't been on this journey with us for a while, we have been in Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature, and it is information that is to help us in how we live our daily lives with God. And King Solomon is giving us this wisdom. Sometimes it seems a bit harsh in what he says, um, and sometimes it feels like we could be a little bit helpless in the way that he's talking about things. But friends, it is all for our good to live lives to worship Jesus. So we turn to chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and we read these words. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow is a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one of the official is eyed by a higher for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. 
As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except for the feast of their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for their wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Please leave your scriptures out. Two major sections here. One talking about worshiping of God, how we should approach God as we gather for worship, and the other about money. Let's look at these in reverse order, if you would. Let's turn to verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. Now, it's important as the writer King Solomon uses the word hebel each time, the Hebrew word hebel, which means vapor, is translated as meaningless as well, or vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, he says. It's hebel. It's something that is not going to last forever. And that word is used throughout Ecclesiastes. It's all vanity. Solomon is stating that life is like a vapor. And then he quickly turns his attention here to the love of money, which he says is also hebel. It's also meaningless. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. I read a blog by Tim Chalice. He's a pastor, blogger, writer. He's very insightful. And he says, what's the deal with the billionaires wanting to, like, continue life forever? I don't know if you read this or read in the news at all, but like Amazon's Jeff Bezos, he's invested in Altos Labs, which is attempting this kind of biological reprogramming to extend lifespans. Just like I said, too, Elon Musk is trying to build spaceships that are easier and not expensive, too expensive where people can actually go to Mars to repopulate. I mean, I'm just thinking, why don't we take care of this place where we're at? Let's take care of what we've been given, right? But why do they do this? And Tim Chalice had an interesting blog about this. He said, could it be that all of their wealth has made their life so amazing they just cannot think about dying? I mean, their life is just so awesome that they just want to keep going. They want to enjoy it forever. Chalice says, I suppose it's possible, but he thinks that there's another factor in play because he's read Ecclesiastes. He's read the Song of Songs. He's read Proverbs. And, and what he's coming to is that he thinks that they're not finding meaning. He says, why is it that billionaires always seem to want to live forever? He says, I'm convinced it isn't because their lives are so satisfying. It's because their lives may be dissatisfying. Chalice is convinced that they still wonder, isn't there more than what we have? Isn't there more? And he says, How do, what do billionaires do then? They double down. They give more money. They try new things, new projects, and we're spending money on stuff that, wow, do we really need it? More money, more cars, more mansions. And what he says in this blog, is, too, is that King Solomon, the one who wrote the words that we read this morning, he had everything. He had money. Wealth, kingdom, power, pleasure. He had, that they say, 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had pleasure whenever he wanted it. The guy who's writing that all of this is vanity could be classified as the Elon Musk of that day. Vanity, vanity, he says. 
Now Solomon had deep passions, a restless heart, and many serious flaws, yet he had the wisdom to know that God put eternity in the hearts of people and knowing that nothing else would satisfy. We cannot look to the temporal to satisfy our longings. Look with me in Ecclesiastes um, 15. It says this, Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. Oh, wow, Solomon, a little depressing again today, right? But true. We will take nothing with us. Last Sunday, I shared this quote. Everything in this life is going to be taken away from us except one thing, God's love, which can go into death with us and take us through it and into his arms. Friends, this is truth. Jesus states these words in Mark 8. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Another quote from an author about this topic, he says, it's in death that God says, if I'm not your security, then you've got no security because I'm the only thing that can't be taken away from you. Now, obviously, God knows that we need resources while we're here on this earth. But what is Solomon saying? He is concerned about our relationship with God. He is the one that makes life worth living. But I don't know about you, but I've lived part of my life, most of my life, distracted. Thinking that things will satisfy, and they won't. We are not to worship money. Now, friends, we don't know the hearts of these billionaires, all right? This was just a blog from Tim Chalice, what his thoughts were. But it begs the question that we must ask ourselves, is our relationship with money helping or hurting our relationship with God? You know, one thing I tell my children is that I say, be generous. Be generous with people. It is just one thing that you will never regret is being generous with people, whether that be money, time, effort, whatever. Be generous. Why? Because first of all, it's good to serve and to help. Another thing is that when we do that, it's always a reliance of knowing that God will provide more for us. God's in that business of providing, and we're to be generous with the resources which we're given. I love my job. I get the opportunity during the week. I got a call this week. Someone said, hey, I want to pay a utility bill for somebody. Awesome. So I had to search it out because I haven't had to do that yet before. So I was going around town talking to the Mid-American, find out what to do. We paid somebody's bill, or this person paid their bill, but I got to be a part of it. I had a gentleman come in this week. He said, I got a brother in Iowa City, and he's, his health is failing. We need some gas money. And I looked right at him. I said, are you lying to me? I did. I said, are you lying to me? Are you telling me the truth? He goes, Yes. So the deacons have money reserved for gas money. I grabbed it out, gave it to them. I said, I'm really sorry to hear about your brother. Generosity from this congregation, and I get to be a conduit of that. I love it. We have to be generous with our lives with our time and our talents. And and King Solomon in these texts wants to remind us that we are to keep money in perspective. Ooh. We are to keep money in perspective because desiring money, loving it, living for it will never satisfy. That is the wisdom in which Solomon is sharing with us. And I know you've heard it before but it's always helpful to be reminded again. We can live distracted lives. 
Look with me in chapter 5, verse 1. Mr. Solomon, as he, at the end of the chapter, talks about money, we're going to go back and talk about how do you worship, what do we do in worship. Chapter 5, verse 1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be what? Few. This, uh, on May 4, there was a reenactment of a, a drunk driving incident that they do at the local um, school, high, high school, Hoskins High School. And it's for the seniors, and they do it every year. And this class puts it on together along with their, their advisor. And they create this incident where they have two cars that are wrecked, and then you have the local police Mahaska Health Partnership, local funeral directors, and they go through this whole process of how they get the kids out of the car, all of this stuff. Well, our son David was a part of that. David was actually, if you see on the right, he was the one who was injured by the drunk driver. And then in this scenario, this reenactment, he actually passes away. And so I had no idea how emotional this would be to see this play, right? It's a reenactment. It's not real. I mean, the kids come out, and you see the cars are already stuck there. I mean, they use the jaws of life to get the kids out. I mean, it's this whole kind of, whoa. And, you know, we had to approach David, and, and they said, just act natural. <laughs> okay. So the nurses lead us over, the high school students lead us over to David, and it's emotional. And I thought... What a powerful way to tell kids, don't drink and drive. Don't be texting on your cell phone. Don't be distracted while you drive. It was a lot better way of, of hitting that point home than just saying, hey, kids, don't drink and drive. And I got to think, the whole purpose of that reenactment, the whole purpose of it was what? to get kids to pay attention, to pay attention to their life and what they're doing, to not put themselves or others at risk. Wake up in your life if you aren't. Think before you act. You see, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, wants us to think more before we act, to reflect deeply on this life that we have been given, not just to go through it, but to live purposefully. Life on this earth is short. It is but a hebel, a breath, a vapor. And he states, when we gather together for worship, do it purposefully. Think deeply. Wake up to what God is teaching us through his word. Solomon writes these verses of how we ought to approach God as we worship. Now, obviously, I'm a pastor. I love church. But sometimes you hear, well, you know, we, it, we look at it as kind of checking off a box. All right? Oh, Sunday, we'll, we'll check off our box, and then we'll go do our own thing. Friends, what we do here is a model for a rhythm for our lives. We get pulled out of the world and all of the things that affect us, the tough things that go through our lives, and we're reminded why we're here on this earth, and it's because of God. He is the reason you have breath, life, gifts, abilities, resources, everything is by His hand. And we remind ourselves about that when we gather. And hopefully we engage in His Word and think about how good he is to us, to think about his grace that's offered to us. We come and we praise God. We hear his word. We confess our sin. What a rhythm of how our lives should be, modeling what life is about. That's why we come here. And Solomon writes these things. I took this from an author in this chapter 5. When we come to worship, these are the things we ought to be doing. First of all, listen intently. 
Listen intently to God's word. We've got to stop talking. Listen. If it's not to me, then just keep reading. Speak carefully. Think before we speak to God. Think of what we say to other people. Is it true? Is it honoring? Is it encouraging? Is it truthful? You see, it says here about a vow or a promise that's being made. Don't make those if you're not going to keep them. We are to respond sincerely to God's desires, to be honest with Him in our lives, to repent of our sins. As we gather for worship, we listen intently, we speak carefully and lovingly to one another, we respond sincerely. There's a, a, a memoir in a, a book called Blue Like Jazz. It's an older book by Donald Miller. And he was talking about being on a campus, a college campus, and they decided that they wanted to put a confessional booth in the middle of a big party, campus party that goes on, where there's drinking and drugs and a lot of different things going on. And they thought they were going to put a confessional booth in the midst of that. And they were going to encourage anybody to come in. And when a student would come in, the Christian would confess their sins to that person. What? Wait a second. Shouldn't they be confessing? No. Donald Miller talks about it in his book. He says he's confessing the way in which he has judged them in their lives and not paid attention to them, and not love them. Here's a Christian confessing to the, quote, heathen. I think the book of Ecclesiastes, if we were to sum it up in one word, is humility. Do we live humble lives before God? And finally, we are to fear rightly. just says it right there. Therefore, fear God. What does that mean? He's the only one that has our future. We are to revere and to trust Him even when we don't have all the answers to life's questions, to honor Him with our words and with our lives. For God is our creator, our sustainer, the only one that saves us into eternity. To revere God is to trust Him even when we don't see what is happening in our lives. To honor Him with our words, our attention. When we gather for worship, it establishes healthy rhythms for our lives of praise, worship, confession, and to live a life that way. One thing I do want to say is don't give up on the local church. It's a vehicle in which God has, has created. If you know someone who has, invite them back. Folks online, I know it's wonderful that you can watch online, and if you can't get here, I understand, but if you could come, come back. Be a part of the body of believers. Grow in our faith with one another. Rub shoulders with other people. Speak encouragement to other people. Now we acknowledge that we worship God through every moment of our lives, but there's something that's special that happens here too when we're gathered together as believers. Have attending worship be a part of the rhythm of your life if it isn't already. And if you attend once a month, try two. If you attend twice a month, try three. If you want to go for the fourth, that'd be great. Attend. Be encouraged. Church pulls us out of the world for a brief moment. And in this chapter, Solomon points out to us we are to view money appropriately and to worship God reverently. Understanding these two things that I was thinking about this week, if we understood these two things rightly in our lives, our lives would be transformed. How important is money in your life? How important is mine? Are we thoughtful to our approach when we come for worship? Do we take a lot of things for granted in our life? Are we apathetic towards church? I read an article that asked if you had to summarize your life in six words, what would they be? 
If you have to sum up your life right now of what you focus on, what you need, what you desire, in six words, what would it be? Knowing these six words would give us a glimpse into our joy or pain or complaint. I'm approaching about 50 years old this fall. And at one of our staff meetings, Marvin usually leads them, and he put in a, a basket some questions, and we were to share it with the group. So I pulled this one out. And it said, in what way do you hope to leave the world a little better? Well, the thing that I love to do is encourage others to love God. Five words. And my sixth word is laugh. Yeah, it doesn't work, but that's, that's what I did. And it's my word, so whatever. <laughs> encourage others to love God. Laugh. That's what I hope, at least that's what my purpose is right now in life. What's yours? If you were to sum up your life in six words. Now, grab those pieces of paper that are before you. And just grab enough. We need to have enough for everybody that comes to the next service as well. Just grab that piece of paper. And there's a slide here. And what I'm just going to do, it's very simple. Six words about your life. We're going to take two or three minutes to think about how to sum up your life. Solomon points out the wisdom of worshiping God and keeping our resources in perspective. What are you really about? Take some time right now and write down six words. You can make a sentence if you want. If it doesn't work, whatever. Just write down what you are about. Go. If somebody's done, who would be brave enough to share? I can point you out too, especially those who are looking down right now. <laughs> Anybody? What do you got, Lowell? Well done. I encourage you, as you finish this, to date it, and then like throw it in your glove compartment. Or throw it somewhere in your junk drawer, and then when you stumble across it, you'll remember what you've thought about at this moment, about what is important in your life. You see, King Solomon in writing Ecclesiastes is all about wisdom, to think about our life, how we are contributing to the world, and how we are loving God. And today he talks about money that it's not going to satisfy. Keep it in perspective and be thoughtful about our worship of God. Friends, doing these two things alone can change our lives. I'd like to invite the worship team up at this time. We're going to close with a final song. But let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for, thank you for your word. And I just pray that all of us as we read it and we think about it, that we can just be silent before you. That as we read this book of Ecclesiastes, that these words would resonate in our hearts and minds to live life purposefully. but to know that you have placed in our hearts a longing to be with you in eternity. Father, we give you thanks for Jesus, 
for his life, death, and resurrection. That there's an opportunity to be with you forever if we just but believe and trust. So, Father, I pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know you as their Savior and Lord, that they would receive you today. For those listening and live stream, I just pray, Father, that you do the work of your Spirit that only you can do. You are so good. You are a Father that loves his children. Just help us through your Spirit to love you back day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.